we have been spending this year focusing on the Christ. And at the beginning part of the year, we looked at the shadow of Christ, and I'm not going to go through all those, but we considered all the, the, the types and, 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 and pictures of Christ in the Old Testament, not all of them actually, just a, a, a glancing of them, and uh, it's just overwhelming to see how much was written in the Old Testament about Messiah to come. And as we saw um, each of those, to realize how much of his nature, how much of his ministry, uh, how much of his deity was really revealed in the Old Testament. And there should not have been any excuse then for people when Christ came for them to, to be caught surprised by the fact that he was coming and that what he would be like. And last week we began to transition into the second part of this Focusing on the Christ series, and that is on the life of Christ. And we, we looked specifically last week at, the, at his birth, the, the birth of Christ. We saw his, his deity, we saw his humanity as well, and what a, a marvelous thing it was. We, we saw from Galatians 4 that he was, he was sent by God. He was, um, he was not necessarily born or created at the time that he was conceived, but rather that, again, being God, eternal God, he was actually sent from the Godhead into the world to serve us. And so today we want to transition then into a, the next section there. You can see the little picture up there that we're going to bring in now. And that is his youth, a topic which um, is not discussed very often in church. There's not a whole lot in the Bible about the days of Jesus' youth. But there is a passage that we just read just a little bit ago, Steve read just a little bit ago from Luke chapter 2, and so hopefully you're still there, um, that we want to consider this morning about this, this t- period of, of Jesus' life. Because you know, many times we, we, we think of Jesus as, as God, and, and he is, and the marvelous mystery. It's a incredible thing. But we we then negate his humanity. And sometimes we focus on his humanity, we negate his his deity. You know, and so we just gotta keep this balance, this struggle of a balance there. But but more often than not, honestly, we t- believe that Jesus is God. And so when we think of Jesus' years of growing up, we don't think of them. We have Christmas and we we rejoice in this little bundle in the swaddling clothes that instantly overnight turns 30 years old and begins his ministry, right? And then spends three years teaching and everything and then he dies on a cross, he's resurrected and, you know, the rest is, is, is history for us. But there was a period of time that Jesus walked on the earth that he was just like you and me, if you would, as much as God in flesh could be just like you and me. And he grew, we're told, just like your kids are growing. we got lots of kids at different stages, different varieties. Jesus went through those stages. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about Miriam and his little aside here, but changing God's diaper? I mean... She knew who he was, didn't she? She had an angel come to her. So she had some glimpse of that this is deity. And yet, she fed him. She nursed him. Did you ever think about that? Jesus being nursed by Mary. And then having his diapers changed. What was he like growing up? Did he play with the dreidel? Now, I know you're saying, what's the dreidel? Was it the little toy that Jewish kids play with? And so did he have a bunch of kids and they spin the dreidel, you know, and, 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 and play with that? Did he run? Did he skip? Did he ever disobey his mom and dad? <laughs> Good. Okay. So like, all the other ones you say, well, I don't know. This one you should know. <laughs> okay. We'll talk about that a little bit later, okay? I just want to see if I can slide that one in and see if it wake anybody up. But, yeah, we know he didn't disobey his mom and dad, Right? But what, what were the things he did? We know that he grew up in a carpenter shop, yes? And that he was known as the what? Son, son of the carpenter. So Jesus probably was a what? Carpenter too. You know what's really kind of fun though? We refer to that as being, this is all a side, kind of like building the stage here. We refer to him as a carpenter. But technically, the Greek word is technon. It doesn't necessarily say that he was a carpenter. In the Old Testament, 
you have the, the, the word, which means that you were a skilled craftsman, a craftsman. And if you were a mason, you were a craftsman of stone. If you were a, um, a carpenter, you were a craftsman of, of wood. It never says that about Joseph or about Jesus. It just said that he was a craftsman, a skilled craftsman. Technon is where we get our word technology from. It's from technos logos. It's the, the study of craftsmanship, if you would. Okay, that's what technology word actually comes from, Greek, from the Greek and everything. A little fun thing. But I find it kind of fun because of being in the line of work that I'm in as a quote-unquote handyman or sometimes, you know, I think an unhandyman. It's only by God's grace that I can do any of that stuff, you know. And when I first saw that, it was a few years ago, you know, I was kind of being disgruntled with the kind of work. I mean, understand my undergraduate work was computer science, mathematics. I ought to be working on computers. I ought to be designing big things. And I was fixing drywall, you know. And, and I was trying to struggle with that a little bit, you know. And I was studying a passage. I don't remember when it was. It might have been for a Christmas message or whatever. And I was translating it from the Greek and everything. And I, and I realized that Jesus was just a craftsman. I don't say just, but you know what I'm saying? That's what I am. If, if I was back in that day, I would be called a technon. And I thought, that's pretty cool. I can do all things through what? Christ who strengthens me. And it's really kind of cool. So when I'm out there and I haven't got a clue what I'm doing on that job site, and I call out to God, now it's really kind of neat because I, I, I can literally say, not just because you're God and you know everything, but you were a Technon, you did this. Help me out. <laughs> and uh, so, anyways, so I want to look a little bit at this time of Jesus' youth. And in looking at it, I want to first of all look at very quickly, but the person of Christ, but then secondly, the purpose of Christ. Because I think that one of the things that we see here, and kids, don't fall asleep on me here, because understand we're talking about Jesus when he was a kid. Okay? So if there's any message that is geared to you kids, this is the message, right? I mean, I try to interact with you, but this is the message, right, Andrew? Yeah, okay, good. This is the message because that little guy sitting on the floor is Jesus. No, no, I know technically it's not Jesus. They didn't have digital cameras back then, but this is somebody's uh, caricature of it. And, and there he is sitting there on the temple floor talking to these elders. Kind of a phenomenal thing. But let's look at Luke 2 here. Luke 2, Luke 2 as, um, as we read earlier, beginning in verse 40. And it says, in the child... And we note that that child is who? Jesus, okay? It's Jesus Christ. And we note that the child, what? He grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God. Well, what's the first thing we see? That he was subject to normal growth. He was subject to normal growth. Now, I mean, this may be just a mundane point here, but again, it's a mind-boggling thing for me. This is God. This is part of the Godhead who became incarnate, and he grew just like we grow. And so sometimes if you sit there and you, you think, boy, I wish I could hit my next growth spurt, you know, sometimes I wonder what Jesus, you know, was he, was he small? Was he tall, tall? How big was he? Was he thin? Was he hefty? We don't know. But you know what I do know is he grew just like you guys grew, and just like I grew growing up as well. And just as God's got a plan for his growing up period, God's got a plan for your growing up period as well. What's the other thing we saw in there? Well, if you come down a little farther, we're told that he was subject to his parents' authority. You say, well, where did we get that? Well, he was there in the temple for the Passover celebration, right, as we read, and then they left. Now, you've got to understand that the caravans back then were long. They were long caravans. People didn't travel by themselves. Okay? There's a, a case in point in the scriptures that Jesus gives about why people didn't travel by themselves. Does anybody know what that is? The Good Samaritan, okay? Yeah, and because when you travel by yourself, you were subject to the robbers banging you over the head and taking everything you have. So people would travel in large caravans, especially at the time of Passover and stuff like that, where you had large groups of people traveling from an area all the way down to Jerusalem. So the caravan got together. They were heading back up into the, um, the region of Nazareth in Galilee, and they would be divided. The, the women would be in a group, the men would be in a group, the kids would be playing. And apparently, Mary and Joseph thought that, Joseph, or that Jesus was what? Playing with the kids. That's interesting to think about, huh? Jesus was just with the kids. 
No, not my Jesus. I mean, he, he was serious and sober all the time. I mean, I'm sure that he was teaching, and they should have expected the fact that he was probably teaching the elders. No, he, they just expected he would be like one of the other kids. Maybe, well, maybe teaching one of the 12-year-olds. I don't know. I think they just expected he was a kid, and he was, he was doing what the kids did. There's also a point that maybe Joseph thought he was with Mary, and Mary thought he was with Joseph. Years ago, in the previous church I pastored, when, after everybody was gone, there were still two little guys left that weren't mine, and they weren't the other family's kids either. And the parents had come separately, and they had lived a distance away. And anyways, the one thought that the other was going to take them, and the other then left thinking that the first one had take them, t- taken them, and they were just playing with the kids, you know? And so now all of a sudden, here we are with these two little guys. <laughs> And so we called them up, you know. And these are the days before everybody had cell phones and stuff like that. And so you, you got to wait for someone to get to the house to realize that they can get a phone call and realize that they haven't got their kids and they got to come all the way back in to get their kids. And uh, but anyways, so I can't I can imagine what's going on here. I mean, this is just you know we had at least phones. They didn't have phones, you know. They they had to wait till the end of the journey when everybody was getting together to set up their own little tents to figure out where they're going to be. And all of a sudden, Mary and Joseph get together and they realize they lost God. I mean, they had one charge, right? That was what? Take care of this guy. That's right. You have the Son of God in your midst. You're charged with raising him. Joseph understands that he's not the dad. I mean, he understands that he's got a, an extremely um, important position here in the earth, right? Could you imagine? Put yourself in their shoes. Could you imagine how frantic you would be at this moment? I mean, just how frantic you would be losing your own kid. That's one thing. But then realizing that it wasn't just your kid, it's God's kid. Okay? And you lost him. And you're searching all over the caravan for him, and you can't find him. Nobody knows where he's at. I haven't seen him since Jerusalem. And now you've got to do what? Go back where? How? By yourself. Remember, you were in the caravan before. Now you've got to go traverse all those same paths that nobody traverses by themselves. And you've got to traverse with just you and your wife to go find your kid. And then they come back to Jerusalem, and they're looking all over the places, right? And so they first probably start with relatives. If they have relatives there, they're looking at other places. And then eventually they finally go where? The temple. Do you understand? This is why I think that they just expected him to act like another little kid. Fran? Probably not even mean anything, but they probably had other kids, so they had to leave them to relatives. So they were Good. Yeah, so they were... They were No, good point. By this point, they, they had their own children. We know that they, he had stepbrothers, or half-brothers, whatever you want to call them. Okay, And so, right. It was more than just the two of them losing track. The other one didn't know. Yeah, good. That's exactly right. Very good. And uh, so, so you got all this going on, and so they go back to Jerusalem, and it takes them a couple days to find him. Okay? And finally they find him where? In the temple. Okay, we'll talk about this in just a moment, okay? The temple part of it. But when they find him, they ask him, why did you do this to us? None of you understand that, do you? <laughs> I'm so excited to see you. I can't wait to spank your butt. <laughs> why did you do this? And, and I think he just looked at them innocently, okay, verse 49, and said to them, why did you seek me? I mean, why, what, why, what took so long? I don't think he was being rude. I think he was asking innocently. Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they didn't understand the statement. But then look what it continues on. Then it comes right off after that then. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. And the word their subject means to be obedient. He was obedient to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And then Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Jesus continued to grow physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But in that growth period, this is a mind-boggling thing too, isn't it? To think of God growing emotionally and spiritually as well. He was subject to his parental authority. If there was ever a kid on the face of the earth who could say they knew better than their parents, it was Jesus. But we don't read that about Jesus. Rather, we read about Jesus doing what? Submitting to his parental, to the parental authority over him. Years ago, at the previous church I was at, um, 
I, I wanted to have some kind of a choir, some kind of a singing thing. I, I like to sing. I don't know if I can sing, but I like to sing. So regardless whether I can or can't, I, I like to sing. And so, um, so I wanted to have this kind of a ensemble thing, you know, something kind of a choir ensemble thing. And so I, I kind of put it together, you know. Even though there were others who could sing much better than I could, I was the guy who did it. And so we had a guy who led music and was kind of over the music ministry. He was the guy who was supposed to get to do the special music and that kind of stuff. Um, he wasn't full-time, just somebody in the body who had that ability. And so I did this, and I let him know his name was Russ. And I, and I, and I told Russ, I said, Russ, now I want you to understand that I, I see myself as underneath you here. You're, you're in charge of the music stuff here. And so I, I, I'm not usurping you. I, I, I'm, I, I see myself as, as under you here. And so, you know, if, if, if there's something that, you know, is not right or whatever, I want you to, you need to let me know. But just so you know, you're under, in your ministry, you're under the head pastor of that church, too. And uh, no, so it, was, it was kind of a fun to get it. I was the head pastor, so he was under me, and if I was under him. And so, but that's kind of what Jesus is like, you know? I mean, he's under Mary and Joseph. But Mary and Joseph are what? <laughs> His children. He's their creator. Isn't that a mind-boggling thing? He's the one who created them. And now he's what? He's under them. And you know what? He did it without whining, murmuring, disputing, complaining, putting him down. We're told that he submitted himself. He became subject to him, to them. Kids, remember this message is to you. Okay? What about you all? Could you say that you are submissive to your mom and dad? That you have made yourself subject to them? That you want to obey them? Like Jesus did? Think about it. Jesus didn't have to obey. He could have said, guys, I can handle this one on my own. Thanks for the birth. I'm here. But he didn't. He was subject to them. Now, I think all this is because of this part. And that is the purpose of Christ that we see here. And just in a nutshell, and let's, let's bring this back out, the purpose of Christ in life, or Christ's purpose in life, was to glorify the Father by doing the work which the Father had sent him to do. When we see Jesus, when Mary and Joseph come back to find him, where do we find Jesus at? He's in the temple. Okay, he's in the temple. But why was he in the temple? That's the key here. Why was he in the temple? What does he tell his mom and dad? Didn't you know that I had to be about my father's things? My father's business, it's, it's put in business, but the word in the Greek just means stuff, things. Anything that's about my father, anything my father is about, that's what i got to be about. I look to see what my father is doing, and I want to what? I want to be with him doing it. Andrew, the last couple of days, has been wanting to do that. I think it's pretty cool, and I feel really bad when, you know, like last night I was working on this presentation, actually, and he sat down beside me. I'm working on the computer. I'm putting together the presentation. Is there anything I can do to help? And I just, I just kind of chuckled. I smiled, and I chuckled, and I said, sorry, guy, i got to do this one on my own. I said, you know, I wish you could help, you know, but i got to do this one on my own. But what a cool thing, you know? I mean, the little guy sits next to me and wants to be with Dad, right? We're going to have our own little football league together, right? Just me and him. And, uh, but it's the same thing when I, when I go hunting and, and they turn eight, they get to start going out with me, right? And play chess out in the woods. I mean, what, what, what more do you want to do in life, you know? And, um, well, you've got to do something while they're waiting for the deer. Anyways, and, 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 and so, but to spend time, he wants to be with Dad. He wants to go work with me. So I can't take you to work yet, guy. It's kind of rough to take a nine-year-old on the job site. It just doesn't go well. I said, if we get a landscaping job and we're just out there raking, I'll take you with me. But fixing bathroom floors, Chris, what do you think? Not the place for a nine-year-old, huh? No. And, and so, but the 16-year-olds, you know, 15, 16-year-olds, they get to go. They get to be with me, you know. And uh, Jesus turns to mom and dad and says, why, why, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I would be about 
my father's stuff, my father's business. Kids? Okay. Now, I understand he was 12. Okay. And so you, you younger ones, you know, younger than 12, you can minimize this, right? Say, well, I'm not 12 yet. It doesn't affect me. Okay. But if somebody was really looking for you and they couldn't find you, would they find you like they found Jesus? Seeking to be involved in the Father's business? Or would they find you playing? Would you be on the Wii? Would you be out in the yard goofing off? Would you be in the room goofing off? Now, I'm not saying there's no place for recreation. Okay? Don't, get, don't get me wrong on this one. Okay? But as Americans, honestly, we love to play. And we work because we have to. Jesus didn't have to. He loved to be about the work of his father. Now this is kind of touching for the bigger kids too, isn't it? What about us? Do I love, do I really love to be about the father's business? Do I love to read his word? Do I love to study it? Do I love to engage other people in discussing and, and glorifying God and to, to give the testimonies? Do I love to, to be able to, to share Jesus Christ with other people? Does it charge you to do that? Or would you rather read the newspaper? Would you rather play a game and never interact about Jesus? Whose business would you rather be about? Let's look at some verses here real quick. Turn with me to, to, um, to Luke 4. I'm sorry, go to Matthew 16 first. Matthew 16, 21. I want to capitalize on this must word first. Um, I, I've been talking about it, but it, it's, if you bring it into English, it's, it's just a small word, D-E-I, day. And literally it means that which is necessary. Okay? Verse 21, Matthew 16 says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. What do you think Jesus meant when he said that he must go to Jerusalem? It was necessary. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? it and so he says so he, that it is necessary for him to go to Jerusalem. Go to, to um, Matthew 24, verse 6. I'm going to start at verse 4 for context. Matthew 4, 24, beginning verse 4, says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled, for all these things necessarily need to come to pass, must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilence, all these things Jesus talked about, it's necessary. It's going to happen. Do you get it? That's what this word means. Turn with me to Mark 13. Mark 13. Talking about the end times as well. Jesus says, in verse 10, he says, And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. It's what? It's necessary. It's necessary. So when Jesus said, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? It was what? It was necessary. It was necessary. Is it necessary for us? Now go to Luke 4. Luke 4, talking about Jesus then being about the father's business. Luke 4, verse 42 it says, Now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place, and the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, 
because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. He says, it's necessary for me to go and preach to other cities as well. Why? This is my purpose in life. My purpose in life is to glorify the Father by doing the works which he sent me to do. My purpose in life is to glorify the Father by performing the works that he sent me to do. He's consistent with this. Turn to John 4. And again, I want to challenge you. I know it's so easy to say, but he was God. But he was God. But he was also what? True man. John 4, verse 34. Jesus said to them, this is in the Samaritan woman passage, and the disciples just brought him food, you know. They had gone to McDonald's and, and, and brought him a, a, a to-go bag, you know. And he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He said, this is my meat. This is what charges me. This is what feeds me. This is what keeps me going. Not the burgers and fries or the, the falafel, if you would, whatever he was eating at that moment. Not the lamb. But this is what's necessary for me to do the Father's will. Perform the Father's bidding. There's other verses you can go to. John 5.30 says, I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. John 17, verse 1 to 4, Jesus spoke these words, lifting up his eyes to heaven, said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. Now get this next statement. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus, from the time he was a child, got it. I know, I know, he was God. Please set it aside for a moment. We're told in Hebrews that he was tempted in every way such as we are, yet he was without sin. I think Jesus was tempted with laziness. I think Jesus probably was tempted at times not to bother himself with some other people because he had humanity. I think he understood me. I think he understood at times that he just wanted to be about himself. Do you remember the time when his cousin John was beheaded? Do you remember that? And what did, what did Jesus want to do after his cousin John, that was John the Baptist, John was beheaded? Does anybody remember what he wanted to do? He wanted to go away to a deserted place. And all the people saw him leaving. He's on a boat cruising along the, the Sea of Galilee. Now understand they weren't in a motorboat going, they're in a little in a rowing boat, okay? And so they're going out across the, the water. And what do the people do? Where do they follow? On land. They start walking on land. They're checking them out. There he goes. You know, and so they're walking along the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And they got to the, you know, and so as Jesus, they turned the boat, the disciples, they turned the boat to, to start coming into the land. People said, what? Ah, there he is. He's docking there. And they speed up a little faster and they get to the spot that he's going to land before he got there. And so Jesus, wanting to get away to be by himself. God wanted to be by himself. Isn't that an incredible thought? He wanted to be by himself, but he looked at the people and he had what? Compassion on them. And he, and he, and he taught them. And that's one of the times he fed the 4,000. An amazing thing. He's depleted. But he's still thinking about... Hmm, wait, wait. He's thinking about others, yes. No. Go back a step. He's still thinking about the work which the Father has given him to do, which was others. Get it? It wasn't that he was other-focused necessarily at that point. You, 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 no, no, no. I'm not trying to... He was God-focused. And because he was God-focused, because he was Father-focused, when he saw the people, he knew that God loved them. They were made in the image and likeness of God, and they had a need. And he set aside himself so he could minister to them. Because that's what the Father would have him do. Daniel, is that right? That's the testimony, right? 
in the car, wanting to leave to see the guy. God says, no, no, you're supposed to go talk to him. But God, I don't want to. It's the time. And what, what, what God can do in those moments. I think Jesus was tempted with laziness at times. I really do. But he didn't give in to it. I'd like to tell you that I'm Christ-like in all ways. I'm a very L-A-Z-Y, I ain't got no L-O-B-I kind of guy. I am lazy. I like to spend time by myself. You guys may have a hard time getting along with me, but I'm stuck with me. So I, I kind of like, I'm, I'm okay with myself, you know? And me, myself, and I, you know the joke, right? We enjoy getting along. We have co good conversations. But I know before God, and this is a prayer of mine, that I would get over that and that at the prompting of the Holy Spirit, at each moment, I would respond. And I would put me aside and be father-focused at all times to be about his business. Why? Because our purpose in life is to glorify the Father by doing the work which the Father has commissioned us to do. When Jesus was about to go up, and he was talking to his disciples, giving them their last charge, right? What did he tell them to do? He says, all authority in the heavens and earth has been given to me. Therefore, what? Go. Therefore, you go and what? Make disciples. The noun there is make disciples. There are three participles to describe how you make disciples. The first one is you've got to go. And literally, it's, a, it's an aorist participle, which means that in, in, in an aorist participle, then it, it, it is applied um, according to the, the tense of the leading verb, and that was make disciples, okay? And so that means it came before that, and so it literally means, therefore, having been sent, make disciples. Jesus had already sent them, didn't he? he and in the upper room, he said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. He'd already sent them. They're fishing. I go fishing. I'm going to go fishing with you. Jesus said, having therefore been sent, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them whatsoever things I have taught you. And lo, I am with you always. always. You're not doing it on your own. I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. So when you go knocking on that door, no, this is not a message just about knocking on doors, but this is that thing that I told you. I'm honest. This is the thing that Bob struggles with, but Bob's got to do. Because it's about the Father's business. There are people in my community who don't know Jesus. And you know what? They're not going to come into this fishbowl to find out if it's fun to play in the water. Jesus didn't ask us to be seeker-sensitive services. He didn't ask us to make fun fishbowls and hope that the fish will jump in. Jesus said to his disciples, I will make you what? Fishers of men. Go out and what? Go make disciples. Go catch the fish. I've got to be about the Father's work. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do what? All to the glory of God. I seek the glory of the Father. Acts 5.29. I'm running through this because of the time. But you, you have the, the references on your sermon. Which he says, Acts 5.29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought... It is necessary. We must. That's our word day. We ought to obey God rather than men. 2 Corinthians 5, 11 and 14. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God and also trust are well known to your consciences. For we do not command, commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Listen, Paul says, I, I, I just can't help myself. I mean, it is all about God here, and I can't help but do the work of God. I had a blast yesterday at, at the... Um, at the uh, the wedding 
um, of Cor Corbin Dixon and his, his bride, Sarah Richardson. Um, not necessarily at the wedding part. That's kind of fun, too. But afterwards, there were two other believers that were there that we got together, and we started talking doctrine. We started talking about the glory of God. We started giving God praise. And I mean, I was charged. I mean, I was, you know, I'd wanted to leave. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the wallflower. I'm not into this kind of, the, the reception kind of stuff, you know. I just kind of stand on the side. But get me two brothers that start talking about the Lord with, you know. Now I'm, I'm here. I want to, you know, I can stay for hours, you know. I was charged. Does the love of Christ compel you? to talk to other people about God and his glory? Does it compel you to do what you do for God's sake? Kids, remember, um, hey, I, I didn't want to lose your kids here. We're still talking Jesus, right? And he was what? 12 years old. He was a teenager. He was a young adult. He didn't start his earthly ministry until he was what? 30 years old. You would consider that over the hill. Anyways, so if you're between the age of 12 and 30, this is for you. Now, if you're over 30, this is for you too. But anyways, a lot of times we kind of, we kind of you know, in that age, I remember being that age. I really do. It was a long time ago, but I remember it. We, we kind of think, oh, uh, this is over my head. This is, he's talking to them. No, I'm talking to you teenagers and you early 20s and you youngins. God wants to use you. And the time to make the commitment is when you're young. Daniel, I praise the Lord for your testimony today. I mean, we've got a great testimony. I went to church all my life. It was meaningless. Over my head. Didn't mean anything. And that's exactly it. Guys, I mean, I know. I was there. For 23 years, I went to church. I knew all about that stuff, but I didn't know him. You heard my testimony. I, just, I rejoiced in it. Too many times, you're going to, kids, you're going to, school, you're going to church because mom and dad made you. Would you be here if you didn't have to be here? Do you want to be here? Do you want to be with God's people? Jesus was found in the temple. And you know what he was found in the temple doing? Talking about God. Talking about his word. Not only, he wasn't teaching them, he was asking questions. He was teachable. Isn't that phenomenal? He was asking questions and he was learning. He wasn't a what? No at all. Hmm. Even though he what? Knew it all. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? It's okay to ask questions and listen to other people give answers. I struggle with that one, too. I struggle because I have my opinions, and I love to the, the, the throw in my little two cents worth. But God's working on me over the last couple of years, you know, 10, 12 years, whatever. Just keep my mouth shut, you know. Control that mouth, you know. Close it up. Let somebody else talk. It's okay. Paul, at the end of his life, 2 Timothy 4, says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is in hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, righteous, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only me, but also those who love his appearing. Paul says, listen, I finished the work. What work did Paul have? Anybody know? He was a missionary to the Gentile. He was going to be a martyr. Good, that's exactly right. And he was about to be that. But God told him he was going to suffer many great things for his namesake, for Jesus said, and that he would be a witness to the Gentiles. And guess what? God used him as a witness to the Gentiles, and he suffered many things for the name of Jesus. How faithful are you to the purpose of God in your life? Let me ask the question. What is your purpose in life? If we had started this message off today with everybody having a pad and paper, and, and, and you didn't know I was going to go into a Bible, you know, so this is just a, ge a generic room, a secular surrounding whatever, and, and I said to you, write down your purposes in life. Give, give, me, give, me, give me a listing of ten things you want to accomplish in life. What would you have written? Would they have been God-focused? I mean, but since we're sitting here, if I asked you that, I know that the, the answer is going to come from the Westminster Confession, Okay, which we don't use anyway, but still, many people say that is what? To glorify God, right? So we're supposed to glorify God. Okay, that's my purpose in life. Get rid of that. What would you have really said? God knows your heart. So if God revealed your heart and all of a sudden it was put up on the, uh, the, the, the overhead here, what would it show about each of us? 
what our real purpose in life would be. What is it that I really want to accomplish in life? Is it the Father's business? Children? Teens? Are you walking in the steps of Jesus? Wanting to do the Father's will? Listen, it shouldn't be that you are only obeying mom and dad because you have to. Ephesians 6 says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Right? Honor your father and your mother, which is the what? First commandment with a promise. You should want to do it just because God wants you to. Not because mom and dad are going to spank you if you don't. Do you get it? It's the same thing for us parents, right? If we only obey God out of fear because he's going to spank me if I don't, then it's not out of love. And the love of Christ is not constraining me. So, are we walking in the steps of Jesus, wanting to do his Father's will? Jesus submitted to his father and his mother. If there was ever a child, as I said earlier, who truly knew more than his parents, Jesus was the child. So how obedient to you? How obedient are you to your parents? Now, I know that's specifically you kids, right? Especially the ones that are, you're in your mom and dad's house. Make the application to those parents, huh? Who's our father? God. And as I said earlier, he's the one that ultimately I want to obey. How obedient are we? Have we really submitted ourselves? There was years ago, there was all this deal about the Lordship salvation and all this kind of stuff, and I don't want to go there. But one of the parts of truly being saved, if you're saved, is the recognition that God is what? The Lord of your life. He reigns sovereign over all the affairs of men. And as Peter and the other apostles said, we must obey God. God rather than men. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your love. Lord, I thank you for your, your word. I thank you for the testimony of, of Jesus being on, on the earth. It is easy for me to discount much of his life because of his deity. And yet, I know, Father, that you came to the earth. You sent the Son Incarnate, to live a life in the flesh that we would have a high priest who can sympathize with our infirmities being that he was tempted in every way such as we are actually tempted yet without sin Lord we yearn for the day when this body of sin this mortal flesh will put on immortality. This corruptible will put on incorruption. We look toward the day when we will be made like you, for we shall see you as you are. But Lord, I pray that while we are here in the flesh, that you would help us to desire your will and your work, that we would join Christ in that work, looking to see what you are about and joining you in it. The night is coming when no man can work. And truly the need is great. There are millions, billions, who don't know you. And you have given us a commission to preach the gospel, to herald it, to proclaim it. And we are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You said in the end times this is what it's going to be like. They're going to profess your name but deny your power. Lord, help us not to be that way. But to understand that your power will be spoken through us as we confront, if you would, as we approach other people, knowing that it's not our words, but your words speaking, spoken through us, that we should not fear what we would say in that day, knowing that the Holy Spirit would give us utterance. Lord, help us to be faithful, to be about your work for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.